Welcome, my sisters and brothers, to this, the homily for the third Sunday in Ordinary Time. And we return to our reading of St. Matthew's Gospel. You remember that two weeks ago, at the Feast of the Baptism of our Lord, we read Matthew's account of the baptism. And last week, we had a little dip into John's uh, understanding of the same event. And today we continue on with Matthew's Gospel. There's been just a slight jump. The jump is the reading of the temptations of Jesus, which happen between the baptisms and our present, the baptism and our present text. But that's obviously because we're going to get the reading of the temptations during Lent, where it comes uh, traditionally each year. So, what we have now is after Jesus' temptations, so after he's come back, roughly to the area where John was, Jesus hears that John has been arrested. He's been arrested by Herod Antipas uh, and uh, presumably taken to prison in Tiberias. Um, so then it says he withdrew to Galilee. That's an odd translation. The verb can mean withdrew, but King James quite rightly has departed because in fact... Uh, where he moved to, in other words, going to Nazareth, leaving there and going to Capernaum, was actually going closer to Tiberias, which was the royal capital in um, in the Galilee. Uh, it was the area which Jewish people didn't go into because uh, it had apparently been built on a cemetery and so was considered thoroughly impure. But Jesus uh, is not moving away from the place where <laughs> John had been taken. So withdrawing is an, is an odd word. He's moving in that direction, but staying within uh, a place more acceptable to Jewish people. So he goes to the Galilee. He le left Nazareth, his home place, and made his home in Capernaum. Capernaum was uh, by our standards a small village, but it was the Jewish capital of the area. And the key thing about it is uh, that it was a small port, but that it was on the main north-south road. So there was an awful lot of people uh, going through the whole time. And uh, Matthew says in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, apparently it was genuinely the territory of Naphtali, but not of Zebulun. So Matthew's geography is, let us say, um, hagiographical. Um, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Nebuchadnezzar, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles. Well, actually, the I'm just going to look here. The, the uh, original uh, in Isaiah doesn't have on the road by the sea. It has on the sea road. Uh, and that, rather than referring to the uh, Sea of Galilee, refers to the route that went along, actually quite far inland by the standards of those days, but along between Egypt and Mesopotamia. It was known as the Sea Route. Um, so the Sea Route ran from Egypt to Mesopotamia, and this was where it ran on its way between those two points. It was a major, uh, major travelling route. And it says, Galilee of the Gentiles. So, again, referring to the fact that uh, after the fall of the first kingdom uh, to the Assyrians, of the northern kingdom to the Assyrians in the, in the 8th century, the Assyrians did a deliberate policy of uh, deportation and importation of different peoples so that uh, there was a thoroughly mixed bunch of peoples of different types, by no means all Jews, by no means all Gentiles, all living together in this area. It was a very much a mixed culture, mixed religion area. And then uh, the prophecy says, The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and those who sat in the region and shadow of death, and this, uh, whatever it meant at the time that Isaiah wrote it, would easily have been understood to refer to the area ruled over by Herod Antipas from Tiberias, because that was a city built on a cemetery, so the shadow of death, but light has dawned. So Jesus is moving into this place to begin to fulfill uh, the prophecy of Isaiah in a thoroughly mainstream, uh, much-travelled 
route. In other words, this is a very good communica communications point for all, for the whole area. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, immediately he's taking up John's preaching. That's exactly the same phrase that Matthew describes John as using. So here, John has been taken away. Now, John's period has come, has come to an end. So Jesus immediately starts repeating the same thing as John has said. But his understanding of the kingdom of heaven coming near turns out to be somewhat different, as we're about to see. So as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now, behind this, there is uh, a whole set of imageries from the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel. Prophet Ezekiel described what was going to happen from the new temple. This is Ezekiel chapter 47. The first thing was that a river was going to flow out from the new temple, um, and it was going to bring life to people. So that appears to have been fulfilled in John's baptism, leading to Jesus' baptism. And then the river was going to flow into uh, a brackish lake and bring it to life. Uh, and the Brackish Lake is actually referred to as being in roughly the same area as the Sea of Galilee was. So Jesus appears to be talking about bringing to life uh, the, the, the war from the waters that are flowing to the new temple in the Sea of Galilee. And it, indeed, people are being taught to fish there. It's uh, uh, The image comes in Ezekiel, the image of the fishermen. So there's a suggestion here that the coming of the kingdom, which is being proclaimed by Jesus, is fulfilling very exactly a prophecy from Ezekiel. And it's even more important is that after the fishing element, uh, we're then told that the, uh, the the new kingdom will involve setting up um, the uh, boundaries of the land uh, in order to choose the 12 people of Israel. So the, the kingdom of God is going to have a new 12 uh, tribes. It's going to be in, inherited by the 12 tribes. Uh, we're going to get 12 disciples later. And then it says, you shall divide it equally. That's our translation. But actually, the uh, original uses the term, you shall divide it brother by brother. In other words, it's very important that Jesus is, starts by choosing two brothers as being the signs who are uh, of of the coming in of the kingdom, the signs of the two of the new tribes, um, uh, brother by brother, suggesting something about the absolute equality of it, because the phrase, of course, does mean you shall divide it brother by brother. It does, of course, mean you shall divide it equally. But here, the importance of brothers is brought out by Jesus choosing brothers. His first choices are two sets of brothers. So, um, he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. He's inviting them into this project of the coming of the uh, kingdom. Curiously, he's not particularly asking them to repent uh, yet. <laughs> he's asking them to do something much more drastic, which is to follow him, which he does. As he went on from there, he saw two other brothers. So we're continuing with this absolute equality of those in the new kingdom. James, son of Zebedee and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Again, James and John, famously the sons of sons of thunder, sons of Zebedee, um, and something which we were going to get with great insistence in Matthew Gospel, you abandon fathers. There are no fathers. In the kingdom of uh, in in the kingdom that is coming, we're all equal. Call no man your father. We'll get later on, um, and that's something which is hugely important for understanding. We're talking about an entirely horizontal belonging in the kingdom. Even these disciples who will be the the signs of the twelve are equal amongst each other, 
and have an equality with us because there is only brethren, only siblings uh, in the kingdom that is coming in. So from the very beginning, as Jesus starts to indicate, making, enriching this text of Ezekiel, what he's doing, uh, this reality of what the kingdom that is being announced is actually going to look like. Then it says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. So obviously this is written at a time when there was some separation between Christians and Jews, because he's referring to their synagogues. Um, but he, that's something that he's doing. He's teaching in the synagogues, but proclaiming the good news suggests that he's doing that outside the synagogues, in places where everybody is. So he's got two messages. Teaching for people who would understand the texts, and proclaiming, which is done amongst people who don't necessarily understand much about texts. And we're going to see how important these are during the rest of the Gospel. Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. Uh, that's going to be how the Gospel from here on works. We're going to get first him teaching, the kind of things he teaches in the presence of uh, Jewish authorities and explains things. And then later, the signs, the curing every disease and sickness. So we get a chunk of Matthew that is now teaching, coming after this, and a chunk thereafter that is the signs. Here, uh, Matthew sets up in advance the structure of what's about to happen. Notice that at this stage, Although he's calling the disciples, he's not primarily teaching them. He does his special teaching for them in the second half of Matthew's Gospel. In the first half, it's reaching to the people. But it's not only Jewish people. We get misled by the later phrase, have I not come uh, to teach, uh, to, to care for the, the lost sheep of, of Israel, uh, which may have been a much more ironic statement than we usually uh, treat it as, uh, to thinking that he was only talking to Jewish people here, but it's quite clear in this region that if he was talking to people, uh, then that's clearly not the case, as the, the very next uh, verse says, so his, spread, his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various uh, diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. In other words, he'd chosen deliberately a point of irrad irradiation that was going to talk to uh, Jews, Gentiles, people from who had lived within the Jewish general region, even if not being Jewish, and people from even beyond that, going as far as, as Syria. So... It's a, it's a very interesting beginning. The universality of the mission does seem to start uh, very early on in Matthew's, uh, in Matthew's Gospel. Um, and we'll see how that um, works itself out over time uh, as, we, as we get on. But anyhow, here at the very beginning of the Gospel, Jesus is, uh, the beginning of his ministry, Jesus is kind of marking his territory. Once John is arrested, he moves into place and starts. And he starts by saying the same thing as John. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he already begins to create the sign of the kingdom that is coming, and in the face of which, therefore, people are going to be able to repent. Because, of course, it's always God showing God's self first that enables repentance. <laughs> Uh, rather than a moral instruction followed by something nice. The uh, indicative always comes before the imperative in practice, even though in rhetoric sometimes it's the other way around. That's uh, central uh, to Matthew, as it is to all the Gospels and to any understanding of grace. A powerful beginning uh, with Matthew setting out quite clearly how he is going to be tackling these things from now on. First teaching, and then signs, 
the only time uh, that teaching is used of anybody other than Jesus in Matthew's Gospel is at the very end, when Jesus commands the disciples to, to baptize and to teach. But here it's only Jesus who teaches. The disciples, when it comes to be their turn, will be sent out to proclaim, to cure, and so forth. But teaching here is Jesus' preserve, if you like, until uh, the very, very end with the Great Commission. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit.